Well, good afternoon. We're so glad you're all able to join us today for our uh, program. It's a new one. It's entitled uh, ETHC History Potpourri, uh, a sort of fun look at the things that are going on behind the scenes here at the East Tennessee History Center. But before we get into our program today, we wanted to make you aware of some upcoming programs and also thank a number of individuals who make these programs possible. First, we'd like to thank uh, the Friends of Knox County Public Library and East Tennessee PBS. Uh, they both help uh, support this uh, genealogy program series, so we're certainly appreciative of their help. We're also thankful to Knoxville Community Media uh, for recording the program and making it accessible uh, for, for future audiences. We also want to make you aware of some upcoming programs. Um, uh, tomorrow, Bill Landry will be with us. Uh, his program is entitled A Last Hurrah. Uh, he's going to talk about some of his latest writings and uh, share some stories with us. So that'll be a, a really nice time to have uh, Bill with us here at the History Center. And then um, on Friday, uh, November 3rd, we have another one of our behind the scenes walking tours of the building. So if you haven't been able uh, to tour the departments, really see what goes on behind the scenes, we encourage you to come out for that. It's a great way to spend a Friday afternoon. And then on November 6th and November 13th, we have our next two in, uh, workshops in our genealogy series. Uh, these are newer workshops to us, uh, two new speakers. On November 6th is the Cherokee Genealogy 101 by Anita Finger Smith. Uh, she's coming over from Cherokee uh, to uh, develop that workshop for us, so we look forward to that. And then on November 13th, it's Myers Brown. Um, he'll be coming from Middle Tennessee uh, to talk about how to interpret your ancestors' military records, what you can, what information you can glean uh, from those uh, records. So invite you to be with us. Uh, those last two programs do not require uh, registration, and they'll be in this room here. So feel free uh, to join us uh, for those programs. But on to our topic today, an opportunity uh, to hear about some of the things uh, that strike our fancy when we're uh, sort of working through the collections or going through the historical record. You're going to get to hear from a number of uh, individuals, number of team members from uh, various different departments. Uh, so each uh, presenter will introduce the next and will sort of be rapid fire or about five minute presentations from each. So it's my honor to introduce our, our first presenter this afternoon, Matthew Buckner. He's with the McClung Collection, and I'll, I'll let him get us underway. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Matt Buckner, and I work uh, in the McClung Collection as a reference assistant. One of the things I like about being in archives is that you never know what's going to come across your desk any given day. Uh, recently, I was given a couple boxes of photos from the Knox New Sentinel archives. These are original photographs that were taken at the time of the events. Um, because of the nature of the photos, um, they're all newsworthy, you might say. Uh, each picture tells an individual story. The nice thing about these pictures, almost all of them have dates, almost all of them have names, almost all of them involve local citizens. So if you have relatives that are from the area, there's a chance that you might find them in this collection. Because of this, um, you know, there's a lot of intentionality to the photos. There's, there's an artistry to them, I think. You can see, and I'll show you some examples of photos that were clearly posed, uh, despite the fact that they were reporting news. So it, it goes a bit beyond just um, an average uh, photo album from the past. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. Here we have a photo of Knoxville. This is uh, this is undated, but most likely circa 1980s. Um, the photos, for the most part, uh, run from the 1940s uh, through the 60s, uh, but I have encountered some stuff from the 1920s on up to the 1980s as well. So there's quite a range of dates that are represented here. Here's a shot from uh, shortly after the opening of McGee Tyson and uh, we wondered if this pennant might still be in existence uh, somewhere here, uh, potentially. 
One nice thing about this collection is that you can really just see history being made, uh, you know, even as people are kind of just living their daily lives. And here's a lady uh, reading the newspaper after the 1964 election. And um, there's a picture of Al Gore Sr. there on the front of the paper as well. Um, there's a lot of um, photos that cover um, disasters, uh, tragedy as well. Uh, here's a family whose home uh, was burned down. Uh, and as you can see, the photographer took the time, uh, he arranged the family uh, in this specific order. Um, and I know this because we actually have another photo from this series as well, um, where they're facing the camera and they're bunched completely differently. So uh, maybe that was taken first, uh, and then they had this idea. Again, um, most of these focus on Knoxville and the surrounding area. Um, this is from 1967, um, someone protesting uh, the Knox Building Trade Council. Here's a couple uh, heading out on their honeymoon. Uh, this is 1956, I believe. Um, this is a good example of a photograph that, you know, um, I had a colleague say this looks like it could be a still from a movie. Um, just very, um, very clearly th they thought about this, uh, you know, it was set up uh, and it was taken in this specific way. Here, um, a lot of the photos deal with uh, athletics, recreation, there's a lot of college sports, there's a lot of high school sports. Um, here's a dance contest. Um, kind of get to see different uh, things that passed for entertainment uh, at that time. Uh, there's a lot of kind of interesting stuff that didn't make the cut um, that, that's also in there that I encourage you to check out. Here's um, a picture from the Smokies, uh, not too long after they came up to Knoxville and they're selling, um, as far as we can tell, some kind of like a coupon book, basically. They're not exactly tickets to the game, uh, but as you see, booster books on sale here. Um, here's a shot, uh, the Knoxville Track Club, and you get a shot of Neyland Stadium, uh, the old Neyland Stadium, there in the background. This I wanted to include because we have a lot of these small um, kind of individual photographs in the collection. And this is the only one that's actually still attached to its original press release. So it kind of gives you some context for why we have so many of these. But essentially, um, this is World War II. Uh, this would be sent out by the military to local newspapers. And you know they would say, this person is from your town. Uh, they recently had this achievement. Uh, this is newsworthy. Uh, and it was kind of, as you can see, um, just kind of a form that could be easily filled in and sent out. Um, they probably had hundreds of these at one time. Um, this is the only one we have here at McClung. There's a lot of military stuff in this collection. I mostly included some World War II stuff here, but there's also a lot of Korean War material. I like this photo because this is from January 1942. It's just after Pearl Harbor. Uh, and you can see that the uniforms are still very much the older, uh, almost World War I style here. Um, they haven't yet made the switch to what uh, we associate with World War II in terms of the uniform they might be wearing here. All right, here's a young fellow. And I like this photo because this is clearly taken in a war zone. Uh, they're at sea. You can see another ship there in the background. Uh, you can also get a good look at his equipment. Uh, he's most likely a spotter uh, looking for enemy planes. Uh, he has his binoculars, he has his headset. Uh, just a very interesting little time capsule. All right, and our final slide. This is actually a civil defense engineer. And these were the kinds of computers that we ran uh, to kind of keep an eye on our skies during the Cold War. All right, I hope you have found this interesting. And our next presenter is going to be Janine Winfrey from Tamas. Hi, everybody. 
My name is Janine Winfrey. I'm the Assistant Audiovisual Archivist for the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound. We are the audiovisual department of the Calvin M. McClung Special Collections of the Knox County Public Library. Here at TAMAS, we collect and preserve the audiovisual and recorded sound history of East Tennessee. Among our thousands of collection objects is our home movie collection, which consists of unique one-of-one one artifacts depicting East Tennessee or created by families with connections to East Tennessee. One way TAMAS receives home movies is through donations. In exchange for the donation of the physical film artifacts for TAMAS to preserve in our archival storage, TAMAS will provide digital copies of those films to the donors. Earlier this year, East Tennessean Larry Whitmer contacted Tamas to see if he could get his collection of over 50 eight millimeter and super eight films digitized. He and his brother were both underwater cave divers and loved to document their adventures. Faced with the challenge of how they might share the beautiful underwater sites with the world, they created a waterproof housing for their eight millimeter camera. This camera is a modified Crown 823, created by the Crown Optical Company Limited in Japan, circa 1960. You can see shutter controls are outside the housing so that the camera can be operated underwater. The focus knob in the front allows the operator to focus. Exposure would have been set through this panel here before going underwater. So this panel actually does remove and that would have been adjusted before the diver went underwater. They would then replace the back of the casing before going on their dive. Thanks to this brilliant device, the brothers were able to create some truly remarkable footage. I'll let the clips speak for themselves. And if you have any home movies from your family, please don't hesitate to contact him.
Hi. My name is Joanna Bolden and I'm in charge of the special materials here at the McClung Collection and I work with Eric Dawson. Over there, you'll hear from him later, the manager to determine we look when donations and possible purchases uh, for the McClung Collection. We evaluate those and decide uh, what we would like to accession, what could go to another institution uh, and that sort of thing. Um, it's very rare that we have a week where we're not receiving multiple items for the McClung Collection. Uh, this year we've had um, a number of items that have come in and our special collections catalog is now online. Uh, that happened in 2019. This is separate from the regular library catalog. So for the special materials, if you, particularly if you have a family member or an interest in things around Knoxville, East Tennessee area, uh, the McClung Collection is a great resource. The materials upstairs that are in the library catalog are fantastic, but then we also might have uh, what we call our special materials, which are items that are one of a kind items, not published books, things like letters, photographs, maps, uh, architecture plans, material of that sort that I take in and catalog. And you're able to search it online by keyword to see if there's something of interest to you. Um, these items need a appointment to view, uh, which you can do by emailing me uh, McClung art dash archivist at knoxlib.org and my email is also on every screen of the special materials catalog as well so it's fairly easy to find and I thought I'd just highlight a couple of things that we've brought in that I thought were particularly interesting this year um, most of the stuff has a story whether it has a story because of who owned it or a story because of how it came to us or maybe we end up creating the story because we end up getting very interested in it, going down a rabbit hole of research, and it's, it's um, of interest to us particular. Uh, this time, this particular item is just a piece of ephemera. It's a hand-drawn advertisement for the Knoxville Aero Corporation. Uh, they operated out of the Sutherland Avenue field uh, over where West High is now, uh, late 1920s. Um, early 1930s, around that time uh, frame. They were airplane sales, they sold airplanes, and they also offered flying services. And as you can see from this, they uh, offered the ability to see Knoxville from the air. For $8, they would fly you around and you could get an aerial view of Knoxville. Uh, they also had a Smoky Mountain tour, two hours, $25. Um, they offered up any kind of, really a lot of different airplane services. Uh, based on the pricing, looking at newspapers, this is probably from around 1928. Uh, what was interesting was we received this in the mail just randomly one day this summer, and the woman had written that, I found this beauty as backing material for a framed photo of my uncle, Charles Hyder Patton, who lived his lived 1908 to 1979, and she said, I remember Uncle Charles's stories about flying under bridges. We don't know, was Charles involved with the air company or on the back of it is a sticker for the post sign company from Knoxville, Tennessee that were located on Gay Street. Uh, they were a company that made signs. They operated for decades. Um, in my research to kind of see a little bit about them, I discovered that they made, they put up this responsible for the new scoreboard at Shields Watkins Field in 1927. That was a big news article. And then a couple of years later in 1929, they added the time clock so people could know what the time was during the game, what was going on during the game. Uh, they also were responsible in 1929 for the new electric sign that went over the Andrew Johnson Hotel down on Gay Street. And so, <laughs> was made out of neon and they made that sign and put that up and then they took down the old signs the newspaper article said so it was kind of interesting so I don't know if he worked for the sign company and just sort of made a lot of these and took them home I don't know if he flew with the Aerocore and just pocketed this but it lived behind his photograph for a number of years traveled to Pennsylvania 
And at some point, uh, the donor unframed the photograph, found this, and fortunately said, oh, hey, I'm not just going to toss that away. I'm going to look and see if I can find somewhere for that to go. Looked online, discovered us, and we ended up with it. It's a lot of fun. Kind of just an interesting little thing. Uh, another thing that we get a lot of prior to Facebook and online posting, people would make scrapbooks. Uh, individuals would make it to remember their personal history. Organizations would do it for their organizational history. We get a number of those uh, each year. This one was particularly interesting. Most of the time, the scrapbooks are newspaper articles. That tends to be what they are. May or may not be identified about when they came from. In this particular grouping, they uh, did identify the newspaper articles, which makes me happy because it makes it easier to know when it's from. But this is a scrapbook from the Knoxville Women's Club. And it is from, it covers May 1949 through April 1950. The Knoxville Women's Club was, it was very similar to a lot of the women's clubs around that time frame. It was started in 1928 by Mrs. Walter Stearns Nash. Uh, they were basically a social and also sort of society club and they would uh, hold meetings where they would have speakers and the women would gather at someone's house and someone would speak on a general topic of interest for a few minutes and then they would socialize. Uh, in this case they have their scrapbook covered is divided by months but each month the divider has this lovely watercolor a themed watercolor that separates the different months. I have the scrapbook over there and you can Look at it, their pages are fragile, and, but um, it is able to. So this was, I thought, it's October, we'll show October, this was Halloween's. They were done by Maurice Brown. And then behind each one, you have the uh, newspaper articles of the club activities and such, and they did a very good job identifying where those were from. Uh, there are some programs in there for uh, like Christmas program and some other things like that, but it was a very, it was a fun uh, scrapbook to look through just because of the, it's like, oh, look at what November's picture is. This is great. So that was a really neat thing. So if you find something in your house and you think it would be of interest to us, you can by all means, you know, contact me, uh, send me an email, phone call, whatever. We're always interested in these fun little tidbits of Knoxville history that make their way back to us. And next, uh, Dr. Warren Doctor, who is from the East Tennessee Historical Society, has it. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the history potpourri. I'm sorry that I can't be here, um, but in lieu of me being here, you have this recording of me, which is kind of fun. Uh, and I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the research that I've done so that I, when I'm around the region, I, I give in talks. And that is about the etymology of the word Tennessee. It has quite an interesting history because no one knows exactly for sure what it means. Uh, the first encounter of, of the term Tennessee or its, its origin, it comes from when um, just after Hernando de Soto, in fact, uh, around 20 years after Hernando de Soto, when Juan Pardo came into the Tennessee region and he encountered the Yuchi people. And they explained to him that the place was called Tenasque. And we know this, this still exists on Spanish maps at the time. Um, and the Yuchi people uh, explained to the Spanish that this was Tenasque. And then it, it sort of enters, enters the kind of European imagination, but it's lost for several years. Uh, and then about 100 years later, almost down to the, uh, to the month, the English start coming in from Virginia. And in the same, at the same time, the French start moving into Tennessee uh, from West Tennessee. So you, you had explorers coming down from Virginia along the Appalachian Mountains, and then you had ex French explorers, fur trappers, Louis Gillet was one of them, um, who came into West Tennessee. And eventually the, the English explorers made it down to Monroe County and they encountered the Cherokee there. The Uchi were gone by that time. And they asked the Cherokee what this area was called, and it, it, it was called Tanase, according to the Cherokee language. 
And uh, there's still actually a, um, a memorial there in Monroe County. So you have Tanasque and in the Cherokee tongue, Tanase. And uh, what's really interesting as well is if we pause here for a second, it, it starts entering into um, English maps. Uh, we, we see this in, in maps as early as uh, 1721, that the region is called Tanase. Um, and, and a lot of these maps were done by Cherokee uh, agents who would go out and, and work for, for cartographers. And, and what's really interesting is then ultimately the spelling of Tennessee. So it was originally um, the governor of South Carolina, whose name was James Glenn. Um, and James, he, he spelled it the way we spell it today. And what was interesting was this was picked up for people trying to garnish his favor. So that by the time Henry Timberlake did his famous draft of Cherokee County, he adopted the spelling of Tennessee that was used by um, the governor. Of course, the governor left shortly um, before he could finish the expedition. Uh, we move along, that became the sort of accepted spelling so that by the time Tennessee, the state, was accepted into the Union after the Re American Revolution um, in 1796, that spelling of Tennessee was adopted. That still doesn't tell us the meaning. Well, there was a an ethnographer around the turn of the century, and I mean the early 1900s, not the early 2000s, um, named James Mooney. And James Mooney uh, studied the Cherokee language and culture, and he believed that essentially the word Tennessee had been lost, that much in the same way the Romans had sort of taken language and custom from the Greeks, that the Cherokee had done the same with the Creek and, and the, the Uchi and other tribes that were in the region. And this, you know, it's unfortunate that the meaning of Tennessee had been lost, but recently there have been studies, I mean in the last two years, about what the actual meaning has done. There's been lots of linguistic studies because there are some people, very, very few in fact, that live in Oklahoma as a part of the Creek Confederation who are traditional Uchi speakers. Um, very few who were, in fact, that was their mother tongue. And they have offered different origins about what it might mean. And one of the meanings is, um, uh, and, and what it translates to is to, I'm gonna ruin this, hold on. To see to G, which means where the brother waters meet. There are other explanations as well, different schools of thought that say that it might mean the fork in the river, which also kind of echoes where the brothers' waters meet. Um, and then there's other meanings like, like the, well, the fork in the river. But the, my favorite and the one that I choose to believe is the meeting, the meeting place. And that is because if you think about all the different forces I just mentioned, you know, the Uchi, the Spanish, the Cherokee, the English, the French, all of these people came and converged here in this land in East Tennessee. And it is remarkable. It's one of the most remarkable places in the world that has been fought over and sifted through by many different civilizations. Um, and so if you think about all those different cultures layered on top of one another, this is a meeting place. And it's ama ama amazing to me that right outside, you know, in our own backyard is this history that stretches back so long with so many people. So I hope that that tells you a little bit about the etymology of Tennessee. Thank you so much. I hope you have a fun time with the rest of your time here at History of Popery. Have a good day. Hi, I'm Zachary Keith. I work at the Knox County Archives. I am, I guess, the digital archivist for the county archives. Uh, today, I'm going to show you a collection that I've been slowly scanning as a side project uh, that we have um, in the county archives, which is the Knoxville Housing Authority and Community Development Corporation records. Um, so these document urban renewal in Knoxville um, from the 50s through the 70s. Um, you know, they include maps, photographs, parcel files, condemnation records, um, everything that went into um, you know, the transformation of the landscape um, during that time period from what it was before to what we know of it today. Uh, this urban renewal effort um, wasn't unique to Knoxville. Um, it happened all over the country and, and the state, um, really starting in the 30s and going um, like I said, up until the 70s, 80s. Um, some of that still exists today. But it started with housing projects in the 30s as part of the New Deal, um, but really ramped up uh, in Tennessee in 45 
when the General Assembly passed um, the Slum Clearance and Urban Redevelopment Act, uh, which allowed local housing authorities to condemn quote unquote blighted areas, but the, that was sort of subjective and left up to the local housing authorities. Um, and of course, in 56, when the Interstate Highway Act was passed, um, highway construction uh, sort of contributed to that. Um, so in Tennessee, um, the highways, you know, when they, when they ran through rural areas, it wasn't as controversial because the land, um, you know, people had large swaths of land. Um, but in the cities, especially the inner cities, uh, a lot of these were run through predominantly African-American neighborhoods. Um, it was no different here in Knoxville. Uh, uh, and in addition to those, like the housing projects, um, which you know were advertised as like modern living to get rid of sort of what they considered substandard housing. Um, a lot of the houses in these areas still had outhouses just because of the, the economic nature of the neighborhoods. Um, you know, they kind of advertised it as modern living. Um, however, many of the people that moved, you know, may perhaps owned their home. Uh, and then when they were moved into housing projects, became renters, um, which didn't allow them to, you know, pass that property on to um, their posterity. So in Knoxville, there were four different um, urban development projects. The first of which is Riverfront Willow. Um, which properly named ran kind of along First Creek from the Tennessee River all the way to Willow Street. Um, and this encompassed um, 97 acres um, along that creek, uh, which was an African-American neighborhood known as the bottom just because of the topography of the creek. Um, and in this development, uh, over 500 homes um, and 508 uh, families were evicted um, to, and it was like a both a residential and commercial district. Uh, in addition to all those homes, the uh, a bunch of businesses, the gym theater, which was the the black uh, movie theater in town, the free African American Car Carnegie Library that was built in Knoxville in 1917 was part of that that was destroyed. Um, the Black Medical Arts Building, which housed a number of uh, African-American physicians, uh, dentists, optometrists was destroyed. Um, and uh, so this first couple of photographs, the first one um, on my right is from the corner of uh, Florida and Campbell Streets, which is up near present day Willow Street. Um, I think either one or both of those streets still exists, but sort of uh, to the north of town. Uh, the one on my left is shows where they're building drainage for James White Parkway. Um, so the intersection you kind of see straight ahead is where Summit Hill and Central meet. And that, you know, if we zoom in, I, of course, these are high, high resolution scans. You can't really see them from where you're sitting. But uh, if you zoom in, you can see the gym theater there, uh, which existed from like 1913 to 1962. Uh, and these photographs are sort of off on their own, <clears throat> uh, in their own box, but each of the parcels that the city condemned um, and or took over by eminent domain had information with them. Um, and the one that for the gym theater actually had this really interesting uh, renovation plan from 1962. It was never implemented because the city condemned the gym theater in, in November of 1962, but there's this uh, architectural rendering of what the, that renovation might have looked like uh, if it had survived. Uh, so in addition to Riverfront Willow, uh, Mountain View and Morningside um, was sort of east of that, uh, east of James White Parkway, uh, where the Civic Coliseum and the Hyatt, what used to be the Hyatt, <laughs> uh, where they are, that sort of uh, hillside. Uh, you can see the image on, on my right is, is taken from the Hill Street Viaduct, um, sort of towards downtown. You can see the Hamilton National Bank, which is the building right next to us, is the really tall building um, at the top of the hill. The image to the left is, is an unidentified building. They didn't tell us where it was um, being destroyed uh, as part of that. So 
Mountain View and Morningside was a 571-acre development um, in, the, in that specific section, over 2,700 structures were taken down. Um, there were 71 minority businesses that were moved. Um, only uh, half of those probably survived the, the, the removal. Um, and the ownership of the businesses um, lessened by 10%. Uh, in addition to this, you know, the construction of James White Parkway sort of segregated the black community toward the north and toward the east, um, not giving them an easy walking path towards downtown. The Yale Avenue project, was, which was the fourth and final of the urban renewal projects in Knoxville, took place on um, present day UT's campus. Um, so pretty much all of the area along Andy Holt Drive and Volunteer Boulevard um, were part of this. Um, it was 134 acres. Uh, of that, 400 families were relocated, um, uh, which includes 325 houses. Uh, in this section of the records, each of the house, houses is identified with a, with a, a street address, which is really nice, um, just because that's pretty uncommon. So the picture to my right is a house at 1900 Lily Avenue. Um, you can see a little girl standing in front uh, with her tricycle. Uh, and then the image on the left was unidentified, but it, it looks to me like it's probably when they were building the field house, uh, which later became Stokely Athletic Center because uh, you can see sort of stadium risers uh, in the side. But there's plenty more to do with this project. Uh, I've only scanned a small portion so far, but uh, the collection's extensive, almost 200 boxes of material. Uh, and following me is John Morton, who is also with Tamis, uh, and I believe he also has a video. Hi everyone, I'm John Morton and I'm the audiovisual archivist for the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound, or TAMIS, which is the audiovisual section of the Calvin M. McClung Historical Collection at the Knox County Public Library. TAMIS is fortunate to have a large and dynamic collection of moving images that illustrate the heritage of East Tennessee, and this collection is growing all the time. Community members entrust us through donation with the amateur films that their family shot throughout the 20th century or we find artifacts available at estate sales or for sale on internet marketplaces and auction sites. Because these amateur films were created privately in households or small studios throughout the region, usually the only evidence of their existence is the films themselves. For this reason, we almost never know exactly what we're going to find when someone drops off a film or we locate a vintage videotape. But there are exceptions to this rule. When amateur films are made with a broader audience in mind, or are made by prominent community members, they leave more traces for archivists and researchers to discover. These traces can aid in interpretation of the films after they reach an archive, or tip off archivists that an artifact existed at one time and may still be out there, awaiting rediscovery. At Tamis, historic Knoxville newspapers, especially the digitized News Sentinel, have alerted staff to previously unknown films. They tend to be described in soft news stories or in social columns. I'll mention a couple examples of these films that Tamis has not found or seen, but would love to locate. A somewhat tongue-in-cheek piece from March 1928 describes an amateur film made by Robin Thompson, brother and partner of Knoxville photographer Jim Thompson, and fellow members of the Wise Men's Club of the YMCA. The film is billed as Stark Ignorance, a clear riff on Stark Love, the Paramount feature film that was shot nearby in the Great Smoky Mountains the previous year. The article describes a series of vignettes of club members, including watchmaker Arch Christian, physician Bob Wood, and banker Jim Stooksbury, working at their jobs and perhaps performing parodies of their work. Cast members are described whispering to mules, repairing typewriters with sledgehammers, and romancing their stenographers. 
These details, along with the information that the film was screened for the club's ladies' night, suggest that the whole undertaking was satirical. Numerous references to films shot by Jim Thompson also appear in the newspaper. In June of 1928, the paper announced that dance instructor Annie McGee would show films that she had commissioned Thompson to take of her students' recent recital. Two months later, a piece ran stating that Thompson had completed a film depicting various activities of the Appalachian Club and intended to distribute it in, quote, various southern cities, unquote, to publicize resorts in the Great Smoky Mountains. And the following year, Thompson's camera rolled as Knoxville socialite and later News Sentinel correspondent John S. Van Gilder demonstrated a magic trick described as, quote, the trained duck illusion, unquote. The resulting film ran at the Tennessee Theater that June. Lastly, a 1927 News Sentinel piece reporting on the growing popularity of home movies in Knoxville society mentions three amateur filmmakers by name, contractor Oscar Dunn, photo dealer Leonard Lamb, and one Mrs. W. M. Fulton all praise home movies for their entertainment and sentimental value. None of these films I've just described have been encountered by Tamis, but we would love to investigate their survival and, if we're lucky, have a look at them. If you recognize any of the descriptions that I've mentioned, or you think you may have some other lead on them or any other East Tennessee amateur films, please contact the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound. Thank you. Hi, I'm Danette Welch. Here is our screen here. Forward arrow. Forward arrow. There we go. All right, I'm Danette Welch. I'm a reference assistant at the McClung Historical Collection. And I'm here today to um, talk to you about how every, all houses are haunted houses, which is a riff on a Longfellow poem called A Haunted House which is far too long to even read you a snippet here, but if you're interested, there are some dittos on the table at the back as you leave. And it basically means that every place still has a mystery or a memory of someone who was there before. And that's what we can help you with here at the McClung Collection is just to solve all those mysteries or stories. Every book, every document we have is designed to help you put flesh on the skeleton of what ever you have or what you want to discover. Today, I'm gonna to tell you, since it's spooky season, a little bit of a spooky story and how it helps us know more both about the town and about the stories that we may have heard. Adolph Ox, who is the editor publisher who brought the New York Times to the famous newspaper it is today, actually grew up in Knoxville in the Civil War and post-Civil War period he lived here as a little boy. Um, he was a newspaper carrier because um, his parents needed all their children to work. They had done well during the war, but there was a bust afterwards. So his father, Julius Ox, had to leave town and look for work elsewhere. In the meantime, his three oldest sons had to get whatever jobs they could. And Adolf, who was the oldest surviving son, became a newspaper carrier. The most famous story that everyone remembered about Adolf Ox once he became famous was that when he was a small newspaper carrier, he started about 11 years old, he was afraid to walk by the First Presbyterian Church Cemetery because of ghosts. Because the New York Times published his father Julius Ox autobiography, we know that um, Adolf's job started at 3 a.m. each morning. He would have to leave his home, walk through the dark downtown to the newspaper office, be there by 3 a.m., and then he would have all his papers delivered by 7 a.m. So he spent a lot of time outside in the dark, and his route required that he pass the cemetery two times. His father wasn't the only one who mentioned it. His brother, when he came back to town and they interviewed him, he's like, oh yeah, Adolf was afraid. He was afraid to walk by. People who used to work at the paper, 
even when in 1929, Mr. Ox himself, who was super rich, super famous, came back to town for the funeral of his old boss, Captain Rule, a reporter asked him about it and asked if he would let us take his picture in the cemetery. And he was like, no. <laughs> When he died, the headline in Knoxville is, boy who was afraid to walk by the cemetery has died. That is probably very annoying for Mr. Ox, but it tells us an important story and by, and Knoxvillians repeated it and repeated it because it's interesting. By the 80s and 90s, um, even though Mr. Ox and his family and his friends and everyone he knew him before never said what ghost he was afraid of, somehow it morphed into he was, he was scared of Abner Baker. And Abner Baker is buried in First Presbyterian Church Cemetery. Abner Baker was a young former Confederate soldier. Um, he came back to Knoxville. He was in an altercation at the courthouse with the courthouse assistant clerk of circuit court, whose name was Will Hall, who was a former Union soldier. And um, he ended up shooting Will Hall in the back of the head and he was taken to jail. And later that same night, um, other Union soldiers took him from the jail and hung him from a tree. So both Hall and Baker died on September 4th, 1865. Um, Will Hall does not really repeated to haunt any place, but Abner Baker may be the most hauntingest ghost in Knoxville. He's repeated to haunt his family's home, which is the former Baker's Peter's house on Kingston Pike. He's repeated to haunt the area of First Baptist Church on Main Street, which is roughly the area where um, he was hung from the tree. And he's also now repeated to haunt First Presbyterian. But we know that the ghost that Adolf Ox was afraid of is probably not Abner Baker, because at the time Adolf was a child, all children thought that Abner Baker haunted that area over on Main Street um, between the jail and the back of Parson uh, Perez Dickinson's house, which the tree where he was hung from still stood into the 1920s, I think. There's um, John S. Van Gilder, who you just saw on there doing a magic trick, did some identifications of sites of a Civil War panoramic photo that Schleyer took, and on it he identified the tree. So all children in the 1860s and 70s knew that if you were going to run into Abner Baker's ghost, that was on Main Street, roughly six blocks away from First Presbyterian. So if, Ab if Adolf is afraid of First Presbyterian, who is he afraid of? In 1863, when Knoxville was still a Confederate city, the Knoxville Register which was actually the offices were roughly right here where you're sitting on the side of Clinch Avenue, just a little bit away from Gay Street. They, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> they um, published from here at that time. And on one winter morning, February the 12th, 1863, not a lot is happening in town. It's Confederate occupied. There's no action nearby. There are a lot of people who passed through the city, military, other strangers, merchants, sometimes refugees from the country. Uh, the city's pretty full, but it's not super overcrowded. A man who, he's probably in his early 20s, and we know that he boarded at the house of John and um, Fanny Bice. They lived right beside First Presbyterian. Uh, they normally had about 10 boarders. They were normally young men in their early 20s, so he was probably no different. But he worked selling newspapers for the register. So like Adolf, he would get up about 2, 2.30 in the morning and make his way to the register office, which, because of where he lived, would require him to pass two sides of First Presbyterian Church Yard. On the morning of February 12th, when he did so, he was walking by and he heard a girl's voice say to him from the cemetery, Mr. Can you help me over the fence? Will you help me over the fence? And he only needed to hear this one sentence because even though we don't know his exact name, he must have been a Knoxvillian. As soon as he heard her signature sentence, he ran all the way to the register office and informed them that he had encountered the ghost of the girl at First Presbyterian. 
apparently a girl who did not know she was dead and wandered the cemetery grounds at night looking for somebody to help her over the cemetery gates to get out. Uh, he wasn't impressed when his co-workers, mostly newcomers, maybe mostly older than him, said, you know, perhaps, you know, it's really overcrowded. Maybe somebody is sleeping in the cemetery. Maybe it's your imagination. No, I heard her sentence. That can't be a coincidence. So this is probably the spirit that Adolf Ox was afraid of rather than Abner Baker. It's sort of amazing that with every newspaper that has been lost between now and then, that this one survives, that you can have a clue of a story that circulated amongst the newspaper people of the city at that time. I have no idea how many minutes I've spent, but um, these are some spooky pictures of Dr. John Mason Boyd's arch and the McKeon vault and a spooky girl in a cemetery. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh, my favorite Dawson's coming up next. He is the manager of the McClung Historical Collection. Okay, thank you, Danette. So yeah, uh, Eric Dawson manages the McClung Historical Collection up there on the third floor. And I'm gonna talk about the Thompson Streetcar Track installation album. We've already heard about uh, Jim Thompson and uh, a lot of his work today. Just a very prolific person. We have the Thompson Photograph collection here, which you can view on the digital collection. Uh, go online and see that, which we'll take a look at here. Maybe. Oh, excellent. Okay, so uh, you can see the URL there. If you go to the Calvin and McClung Digital Historic Collection, you can look at this uh, streetcar album. It's recently been digitized. It's a 183-page photograph album with four images on each page uh, made by local photographer Jim Thompson chronicling the 1904 to 1907 installation of the streetcar tracks that ran through Knoxville. And if you scroll down where it says Browse, uh, it's laid out for you there, and if we just pick sort of a random part to look at. Uh, you'll see how it's laid out, as I said, there's four uh, on each page. And if you scroll down here to the bottom, uh, where it says album identification there, it will tell you uh, what each photograph is. On the back of each photograph is the identification number, uh, the date, and the location of each photograph. In this case, we've got four photos from Oak Street. Mm -hmm. And you can expand this out to get a closer look at what's going on in here. And the bottom uh, right one, this one, happens to be uh, at, right at the intersection of Broadway and uh, Jackson up there. So it's not too far from where we are. And the others are not quite as identifiable. Um, it tells you where you are, and the, if you look at old directories and old city maps, it might give you a better sense of where things are. What's so unique and interesting about this album is that these, this is vantage points that aren't going to exist in any other collection. Because of the specific job this was, that he was documented and paid to document, uh, you're not likely going to see some of the angles and some of the houses and landmarks that are there. There's a search feature um, that you can sort of, if you think of a street or an area of town, there's Lonsdale in here, there's Fort Sanders street tracks. I like to look in South Knoxville uh, because it's interesting that area still was not very developed at the time. So to search through all the ones from South Knoxville ends up with some pretty interesting images. Uh, the last one here, loose photographs. These were not uh, on the page, they were just sort of individual. But fortunately, we still have them ID'd here uh, with the description. For instance, this one here is Chilhowee Park, Magnolia Avenue, north from Spruce Street. So that gives you the general location over there, Park City, to show where, where you're looking. And you can see a house there. 
So by looking at the directories and old maps, you can maybe determine who lived there and even investigate the house history with some of the resources available at the McClung Collection or Knox County Archives. Um, whoops. Does anybody have a particular neighborhood or street or anything we want to see if it might be in the album? It's y'all out of part of town. What's that, Lonzella here? <laughs> So, and again, you see all the returns we have here. So all of these are gonna either be, doesn't necessarily mean that the street or the neighborhood's Lonsdale, but it's the Lonsdale line. And it also uh, could be looking from that direction. So if we go down and look at the record here, top right and bottom left. So these are all Lonsdale neighborhood photographs. <coughs> and we've put, when we put this, I don't know how many of y'all on Facebook or look at the Knoxville, Tennessee History and Memories page there. But when we put things like this online, people like to, to grab them and look and do their own research and sort of determine where this is. Um, Joanna, who spoke earlier, is the archivist. She's the only archivist here. She does have a couple of assistants, but there, we just have so much here. There's only so much we can do in terms of the research and the looking behind the scenes. So there is some crowdsourcing that goes on that's really interesting that when we put this stuff up, people will either contact us directly or put it on social media and have done different angles and looked through it to uh, sort of determine what we're looking at in more detail. But anyway, the, the album is sitting over here, um, you spread out so you can see what it originally looked like. We ask you maybe not to turn the pages so much, but if you're curious what that is. And also to imagine Joanna and the assistant sort of the work that goes in to removing these things from the uh, books and scanning them and, and just sort of the care and delicacy we have to take and then all the data entry that goes into it. You saw the record there, how much information is there. And finally, I'll just mention that um, early next year, we haven't set a date yet, but one of the programs we're gonna have in here is Joyner and myself are going to um, have a presentation with an Oxford History Project with Jack Neely because they've taken a fascination with this and have been looking at it for a while. And we're gonna talk about uh, look at some of these images more closely and where they are and also talk about the sort of symbiotic relationship we have with that organization of which I'm sure you're all familiar. And now I'm going to bring up uh, Eric Head, the head of Knox County Archives, to talk about his work. Can you take it from here? Sure. Okay. All right, cool. Well, let's see. We'll do this. Okay, and then just that's the back. Well, there it Aha. is. I saw it. All right, there you so. are. There we go. So I am Eric Head. I am the archivist here, not the only archivist here. <laughs> the, Joanna is the archivist with the McClung Collection. And I am the head of the Knox County Archives. And we are on the second floor of this building and we are responsible for taking in, organizing, maintaining, and making available the public records of Knox County government. So the permanent records. So my goal here to speak today is that uh, we process records here on a daily basis or as they come into us. But we still have some old records that are non-processed that date back to the, 18th, early, the 1800s and the early 1900s. And one of this is the circuit court. And so we are slowly working on this. Um, all the cases for this were dumped into boxes at some point in the past before the archives was created. And what we've done is we have been trying to reconstitute the files back into their original order. They're just, they were just loose papers. Sometimes they were together. Sometimes they're just loose and we're trying to build them back into the file. Uh, we had this with two of our courts, the county court and the circuit court. We've completed the county court and we are currently working through the circuit court. So recently, or in our most recent group that we were working through, we pulled up some circuit files from the 1870s and we opened up one of them 
and we got this, and this was a counterfeit case, and this is the file here. And what I will do is inside is the actual counterfeit note that was in question, which is rather unique because most of the counterfeit suits we have seen processed in the courts usually have a facsimile of the, of the note in question, but here we have the original one. So it was, uh, it was kind of, of interest. And what I'll do is I'm going to come down, I will pass it around, uh, just to make sure I get it back. <laughs> So what's interesting about this note, it's an 1863 legal tender note, which would um, become, later become known as U.S. notes, and which uh, were printed all the way up into the 18, or 1970s, I should say. If you ever have uh, come across an old uh, like $5 note that has a red seal on it, that would be a U.S. note. This is a legal tender note. Uh, so this was a $100 note that was part of a purchase made by a local uh, uh, someone here in Knoxville, they were purchasing some fertilizer from a company in Savannah. And as part of the $952 payment, oh, well, let me go over here. As part of the $952 payment, they sent this payment down to Savannah, and the receiver of that purchase took the, the money to their local bank, who reviewed the money and notice that this $100 note was a counterfeit, and so they refused it. And it was sent back, and of course, um, the merchandise had already been sent to Knoxville. This was payment. And so naturally, just as we would do today, there was a lawsuit that ensued. And what happened um, was they came up, the money was sent from the People's Bank, which was here in Knoxville. In fact, it was on this block in Knoxville, it was between here and the corner of Church on Gay Street. And so this lawsuit progressed. Um, what happened was that there was a deposition that the, the institution down in, or the company down in Savannah was gonna ha have a deposition taken. And um, the local company here, People's Bank, who was being sued, objected to that, but it, it went through, went anyway, and then as part of the prosecution of this particular a case, um, it was initially thrown out of court. And the deposition was the condemning evidence that was issued by the, the banker down there show, stating it was um, counterfeit. So that was then into legal dispute. Um, it went to appeal. The appeal said, no, we can, you could enter the deposition. The deposition was then admitted to the court and the two parties immediately settled. So we don't know what happened. And I have a theory as to what happened. My theory is, is that the banker, the cashier of the banker, of the bank, People's Bank, cashier was really the manager of the bank itself at that time, so it's not just a teller that we would think today. They actually managed the bank. His brother was a local businessman, and what I theorized what happened was is that they took in this, this $100 counterfeit note and said, oh no, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna eat this? And they said, no, what we'll do is we'll pass it on to a company that's a little far away. You know, they may or may not catch it, and if they do, they're a long way away. What's the probability that they'll come up here and sue us for it? So, but they did. And so you'll note on here that in this particular photo of it, you'll notice that the corner is clipped of it. This is a process that the local banker would have done to indicate it was a counterfeit. They would either punch it or they would clip the corners to show that this note was no, no longer valid if they didn't confiscate it as it was. But here it was under dispute, so it made it into this case. This is, um, this is the, an original note of this nature, or, or one that is not counterfeit, and I just uh, pulled this off a of web. Um, you can see what it looks like in its entirety when it's, uh, when it's uh, complete. These notes are very valuable today. Um, they're rare, this style, and you notice it's very different from the type of money you would find today. It's larger, uh, but this note, if you were to go, they estimate there may be 60 of them that survive or something, they're, but they're of such value that these notes in auction go for somewhere in the upper five figures to low six figures. So a hefty chunk of change. So here was the issue with the counterfeit. It was a, this is a high quality, very exceptional counterfeit. And I don't know if you can really see it here, but the, when the counterfeiter was making it, 
you'll note in the two areas I circled that there's a little $100 note, a $100 indicator. And they differ on either side. One is in reverse and one is in straight. The counterfeiter reversed it, he flipped it. So you'll see that this says 001 as opposed to 100, and it's the reverse here. It says 100 versus 001. The quality of the note is exceptional, but it only takes one small little error and an eagle eye for someone to catch that. Now the banknotes of that era, there was a large variety of different type of banknotes. So the bankers or the cashiers of these banks were usually very well trained and had a reference manual that they would look at to just to try to verify that these notes were real. So I just want to, I just called up a printing press. You, this would be something like the counterfeit would have used to make his notes. Um, just a little summary of the court case. It, it was filed in uh, 1870 and um, it was like I said down in Savannah. It was determined to be counterfeit by the Merchants Bank, National Bank of Savannah. Uh, let's see. The inflation adjusted value for that note today would be $2,256. So if we were to take the $100, we're not talking about the collector value, just the straight face on value that would be worth, that's the value in the dispute here. And uh, so what I did is when we were when we discovered this, it was, uh, I got, Kind of pretty excited about this. I like old money, and um, and we rarely find something of this nature. And so I have a catalog at home with this, and in that it talked about it, they actually had a mention that there is a well-known counterfeit off of this, and this one, this particular note matches the problem with that. So this is one of those well-known counterfeits. You wonder how valuable would they be? Well, I don't really know. It's hard to find one in auction, but they may be as valuable as an actual note because of their rarity and the high quality nature of the particular notes. Some of them, the counterfeiters were not quite up to, up to par and the quality of their notes were much lower. And so that's really pretty much it. I just wanted, you know, you never know what you're going to find when we're going through our material. We found all sorts of interesting things and this is just one of them that we found. And I thought it would be interesting just to show you what, you know, you open up a packet, you never know what you're gonna get. But I do know I want to get my note back. <laughs> Very good. All right, thank you. So thank you all for coming. Does anyone have any questions for our presenters today? If not, we look forward to seeing you again in another one of our programs. Enjoy the rest of the afternoon.